Great. Welcome. Nice to see you back for the next week. So this is sort of a, a one-off week because I thought it might be useful to do a little bit about measurement theory, where I thought and other people confirmed that, yeah, it would be good to know about unsharp measurements. Okay, so what is the, what is the motivation for, for this lecture? Because that will lead naturally into the topics that we, we sort of cover and, and the concepts. So in quantum theory, when you have the standard description of the, the state, the evolution due to Schrodinger equation, and then finally you have this postulate about what happens when you measure a system, right? So the, probably the earliest version you had was if you have a state psi, then you can measure, so you, you can sort of make a measurement on it, so you can measure psi, measure an observable A, And the observable A is going to be Hermitian, so it has a nice spectral decomposition, so you can write it as sum over the eigenvalues A, and then I, I use the same, so the A is the eigenstate and the A outside are the eigenvalues. And, okay, and again, I'm, I'm dealing with finite systems here, so there's no, there's no continuum, it's all discrete. Um, and so what happens, I say the, the probability of getting um, a particular outcome A is then equal to psi, uh, sorry, A psi mod squared, which is, so now if I write, so for example, if I write psi in that same eigenbasis, which I can, I write it as CA times A, then that means the probability of getting A is mod of CA squared. This is all very standard. Okay, but I also know that the state after um, getting the outcome A, then it's just the eigenstate of A. So if I, I have completely, by measuring uh, whatever outcome I get, I know that the post-measurement state is indeed that eigenstate. Um, and even if I, if the state, if I forget the outcome, or if I don't, or if forget or ignore the outcome, so I don't have the information about it. Okay. So what happens then? So, so what do I mean by this? I say there is a measurement done, um, described by the Krauss operators that are these these uh, projectors on on A, but I don't actually see which outcome it is. So it's the full channel. So then, the full channel. So rho prime, I would say, is equal to this is the usual channel decomposition, so it's A times those projectors, so it's A, A, rho initial times A, A, well, rho initial we know is just psi, psi, and then A, A again on the outside. So then what I end up getting is the sum over A, C, A, mod squared, A, A. And so this is what we refer to as decohered with respect to the eigenstates of the observable. What I mean is that initially we started with a, with a pure state, and in particular the pure state has coherence, so every one of these uh, CAs, they have a phase, and so there's phases between the different eigenstates, and all of that has been lost. The probability of being in the eigenstate A is still the same, it's this, it's here it's mod CA squared, in this final state it's also mod CA squared, so for example if I now measure this state with the observable A, I would get the same properties again, but I've lost all of the, the phase information with respect to this eigenbasis, okay? Okay, so this is the, the usual way of speaking about projective measurements or project PVMs, projective valued measurements in, in quantum mechanics. But this leaves us with some questions. So first of all, this is a very abstract description, so I haven't really said how I'm going to make this measurement. So if A is, for example, the spin of a single particle, then it's not something that I can do with my naked eye. I can't look at the spin of one particle in my naked eye. So there must be some manner in which I transfer the information about A into another system that I can actually look at. So this is the first thing that's missing. So what is the, the pointer? And the pointer is really something that we as an agent can observe, uh, which is so it's macroscopically observable, but also we have the ability to link it to a microscopic observable like a spin. So where's the pointer? 
The second thing that this leaves uh, out is, um, well, this is, a, this is what we would refer to as a strong measurement. I have a projective measurement. After the, the measurement, I lose all of the information here, and I project it into an eigenstate if I do see the outcome. Of course, the advantage of that is then I'm assured something. If I make a strong measurement, and I get the outcome A, then I know what the state is perfectly after. So I know then if I repeat the measurement A on this, I'm only going to get this outcome. So this is really the strong measurement case. I, I disturb it completely, but I have a very, um, a, I'm very assured of what the final state is. So now what happens if we do not want to disturb completely? So we have not strong measurements. And this leads us to the concept of unsharp measurements, which will be sort of the main topic that we we really look through today to plug the, the whole spectrum between very strong measurements and very weak measurements. And the third thing that one might ask looking at this is, well, so this is quantum theory. And then we have classical theory where, OK, I, I make a measurement of like the length of this desk or some other macroscopic object in front of me. And in that case, I know that I do not disturb the system. So that's what I'm used to. So there must be something happening between going on the level of quantum systems of a few, a few one particle or two particles, to everyday physics where I have a really large number of particles, and I know that I can do measurements without disturbing the system. But if, of course, the whole universe is, if, if we say this is really the underlying description, then there must be something, some description within quantum mechanics that allows me to understand macroscopic measurements. Measurements on, on the scale of classical physics, where we are used to not disturbing the system. Okay. So these are the, the sort of questions that we will be answering, really, by looking at the, the notion of an unsharp measurement. And from today and tomorrow, the idea will be to understand what is going on in each of these things. OK, so let's, do it, let's deal with the first question. How do we get an explicit me measurement result? Well, we put in a system which we call a pointer. So in today's lecture, I'm going to deal mainly with position pointers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have another system. So I'm going to call this the second system. I call it P or Q. Let's call it Q. So I have my S is my system. And Q is the pointer. OK. And so I'm going to start, for example, in my, in my state of the system the same way, so psi of S is indeed the same thing as we had there, so CA, A. And then my pointer is going to start in some defined state. So uh, let's say that psi of the system and the pointer is given by this, tensored with some phi 0 of the pointer. OK? And now, in this case here, I'm going to take, for a very simple example, I'm going to take this to be the way for the, um, a position pointer whose position is 0. So this pointer here is now just a xp, describe a continuous variable system, a pointer. OK? Now, what is the easiest way of saying, ah, I make a strong measurement by using this pointer? Well, it's very simple. What I want this pointer to do is to move its position to indicate what the eigenvalue of, of this observable is. So the, easy, the nicest transformation, transformation to do is the following, CA, A, and then for each A, so at the moment here, it's just a, a, um, it's an uncorrelated state. It's this, tensor that. But now what we can do is for each A, we translate the pointer to x is equal to A. Okay. So I start out with my pointer. So this is really, I can put it as, this is my pointer state, x, and let's say, phi q. And I start out with the state at, let me use another thing. So this is my, this is my initial state here. And then it's, if this is the value of a, it just translates to a value to that state there. OK? Right. And this works in the, exactly the same way. Now, now, the new thing that I do physically is I say, well, when I observe this system now, if I want to observe what the outcome is, I actually observe the pointer. It's actually a physical pointer that moves in space, so I look at it and I say, ah, I make a strong measurement of x and, and I see the value a. Okay? Um, 
This will work exactly the same way as the strong measurement I've just described, because if I write now the, the full density matrix of system and pointer, it's going to be sum over A, A prime, C A, C A prime star, A, A prime, tensor X equals to A, X equals to A prime. And now I take that x equals to a is really the delta function of the of the pointer, which means that um, x equals to a, x equals to a prime, the overlap is zero, or delta a prime. It's only the same if you actually have the same eigenvalue. And so in this case, what do I have? If I look at the state of the system alone, and I trace over the pointer, then everything here will vanish except when a is equal to a prime, and I get what I had last time, mod c a squared a a, which is exactly the decohered state. And if I look at the state of the pointer alone, so I trace out the system, again here I have the same thing, a and a prime are eigenstates, uh, so I get a delta a, a prime here, so I end up with sum over a mod c a squared of x equals to a, x equals to a. Okay. So fully decohered system state, but a pointer state whose probability of being at any one of the um, at x equals to any one of the eigenvalues is exactly mod c a squared, which is our probability there. So we've just translated that into an explicit pointer ring. Now, this transformation, I just wrote it as a transformation, but it actually is a unitary operation because we can do this in a very simple way. All we need is that for every eigenvalue a, we need to translate the, the pointer by a. The translation in x is done by a momentum operator. So remember, e to the i. The translations in x, let me write that in thingy. Translation by a, um, so of, of the x degree of freedom, is given by this operator, e to the minus i, a times p. So I don't know if you're used to this, but the, yeah, momentum e to the i a p is a translation in x, e to the i x is a translation p. Well, with minus or pluses appropriately. So here I can do the same thing. So all I need is that each one of these for, for a given A becomes E to the minus I, that eigenvalue, which means that in total, I can simply have the following unitary E to the minus I. Ah, sorry, this keeps slipping down and the volume keeps changing. Sorry about that. So E to the minus I, A, tensored P, so A on the system, P on the pointer. Because if I act on this, on the outside of this initial state, then of course I can take it into the sum because it's a linear operator. But within each sum, when AS acts on the system, it's, it's an eigenstate, so it just gives me, it just replaces the observable there by the value of it, which is A, and then that, that multiplying by P is a translation by, by that much, okay? So this leads naturally, and actually this is almost the complete picture, this is the von Neumann picture of measurements, a von Neumann model. Where, so it's exactly that, but it's just more general than just position pointers. So I have, I have a system psi, which is equal to sum over A, C, A, A. Then I have some, this is my system, then I have some phi on the pointer, so phi naught on the pointer. Uh, and then what I do is I do the e to the minus i times a times some, oh, sorry, a tensor p. And p here is like, I, I use p because it's a, a momentum, but it's really a generalized translation operator. Translation, and I'll do a simple example of with qubits shortly. And I do that on psi system tensor phi naught p. And what that ends up with is the sum over a, c a, a tensor e to the minus i a times whatever this translation is on phi zero of, oh, sorry, I started using p because I was doing that yesterday. Let's keep it q because otherwise the p's are all over the place. Okay, yeah. So 
With pointers, you have a very physical intuition about it, but I could also, for instance, and this will be heavily covered in the tutorial, I could use a qubit as a pointer if I, if I only need, for example, two outcomes. So for instance, the C0 gate is, for obvious reasons, an example of this. So what do I have in a C0 gate? I can have alpha 0 plus beta 1 on the system. And now I have tensor 0 on the pointer. And what the C0 does is it says, well, if it's 0, it keeps the same. If it's 1, it translates. So it goes to alpha 0 uh, tensor 0 plus beta 1 tensor 1 pointer system, pointer system. And this you can write down as, so what you can see is that if I look at it in terms of the shifts, on the system, if the system is 0, the pointer remains the same. If the system is 1, the pointer shifts. So this is the observable, so the A in this case is, is the observable, um, well, it's just the observable 1, 1, which is identity plus, um, sorry, minus Z, minus Z, yes, over 2. Okay, this is our observable. You choose the observable by, by deciding how much you want to shift for each of the eigenstates. And you see, 0 doesn't shift, so that must well, have a zero eigenvalue, one must shift, so I could put a constant in front of this, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, the, the translation operator is slightly trickier, I think it has x as well as z, but it is a rotation operator within the block sphere, so you know that if you have zero, um, well, to go from zero to one, there are multiple things that will rotate, you just have to pick the one that has a plus here instead of a e to the i, e to the i pi by 2, well, instead of i or minus 1 or something like this. I think this, yeah. Um, I will not put it in, in, in detail here, but yeah, the observable p is a, a rotator in the block sphere. Rotates 0 to 1. Okay, so... So here you see this is the most general model now. You, you simply have some physical pointer, it gets translated. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so one of the things that we're not going to do in this lecture, because it really, to me, still is, uh, I'll say, philosophically unsolved problem in quantum mechanics, is what you can note is that, in some sense, I've also simply shifted one of the problems that we started with. So a problem that we started with was, oh, I don't really know how I go from that's the abstract description of the observable to I see an outcome. So I said, oh, I must involve a pointer. So now I've involved the pointer, but in principle, I have the same problem now on the pointer. So if I, if I did this position measurement, at the end I have that the state of the pointer is given by this, and now I say, well, I measure in x. So in principle, I could say, well, if I measure in x, then I should add another pointer and, and then you know, look at the, the third one in order to see what, what value I would get here. But in principle, some, at some point, this process stops, and this is the, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. At some point, we say, well, we can projectively observe an outcome, and we see a single outcome. Of course, this leads to the whole concept of how do you interpret outcomes in quantum mechanics, interpretations of quantum theory. We will not deal into that. All we want to know is, all we want to deal with is really the transfer of information from the system to the pointer. We assume that we can actually look at the pointer and find out the value of x, or in the case of a qubit, find out the value of the spin via a projective measurement that works. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, uh, it's a good question. I haven't, I haven't um, uh, dealt with that completely. So I indeed, if you, if, you have a, if you have a number of degenerate eigenstates, then here you would, they would all get plugged into the same outcome. So then in order to differentiate between degenerate eigenstates of an observable, so let me put it this way. If you, if you use the von Neumann, model, which is A tensor to translation, then any degenerate eigenvalues will come under the same outcome. So you basically club them together. So for instance, there you would have that um, coherence in those eigenspaces would also be preserved, for example, yeah. So if I, so if I, have, a, if I have A that is, for example, so let's just, this is a short example. So if I have A that is uh, 0, 1, and 1, for instance, and my state of the system rho was, well, something completely general. Then my rho prime, the decohered state, would then 
it would have zeros here. It would have the same, but these would be preserved. This, all of these would be preserved. And the reason these would be preserved is because indeed they are in the degenerate space, so they will not get decohered. Yeah. So you only decohere between eigenspaces. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any questions? No. All right. So, so far I've discussed the case with the position pointer that I start in a state that's a delta function. So when it's translated, all of the different versions of the translation are uh, orthogonal to each other. And now the question is, what if I don't? So what if x equals to, well, so x equals to a, x equals to a prime, a prime not equal to a is not equal to 0. Okay. Now this is really where we're going into the unsharp part of the, the measurements, because what we're saying is um, we, have a, we have a pointer state that is not so well defined in the beginning. So even though it shifted, we don't actually know exactly which outcome it corresponds to. So let me now do a specific example. So imagine that I'm really doing um, the, the measurement of a spin. So I have that my psi is uh, C0. Oh, let's do it as plus and minus. So let's call it C plus, plus, plus. C minus, minus. Okay. And I want to measure, so my observable A is, is indeed plus, plus, minus, minus, minus. Okay. And I do it with the, the, the um, XP pointer, so an XP pointer. So what happens? So I have C plus, aha, uh -huh, XP pointer, and it starts with some wave function. So let's just call it um, initial state is some psi. Um, well, I'll, I'll write it in this form, psi of x, which basically the, this is defined as saying that if x psi of x is equal to the wave function psi of x. So I just put the wave function in the ket to indicate what the state is. Okay. So what do we have? So now I say uh, da, 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 x, so psi s tensored phi of x. What will it go through with the usual von Neumann measurement? Um, so now we break it down into the sum c plus and c minus. So I'm going to get c plus plus tensored. And this is going to be the one that's moved in front. So this is actually the wave function psi x minus 1. And what this means is that it's the state that it used to be at one step left. So this is actually a translation to the right when I write psi x minus 1. And then I have c minus minus tensor phi of x plus 1. OK, so I write down the state of the system and the pointer. Um, after the measurement in full, so it's just the this times itself, the get bra thing, so C plus mod squared plus plus tensor phi x minus 1, phi x minus 1 plus C minus mod squared minus minus tensor phi x plus 1, phi x plus 1 plus, and these are now the new terms, c plus c minus star, plus minus phi x minus 1, phi x plus 1, plus c plus star, c minus, minus plus tensor phi x minus 1, uh, sorry, this is wrong way, phi x minus 1, phi x plus 1. Okay, so this is just standard. And now I say, well, we do the same thing that we did there. What is the system? What is the pointer? So what is the state of the system uh, at the final thing? So now I trace out the pointer. So for each of these now, I just get the, the inner product between all of the brackets that I had. So I'm going to get C plus mod squared plus plus, 
as usual, C minus mod squared minus minus. But then I get two more terms from here and here. So this is now plus C plus C minus star plus minus with this inner product, phi of x plus 1, phi of x minus 1. And yeah. So no, C plus is always with the cat. C plus is with phi x minus one. Oh, do you mean? Do you mean in this one here? Ah, this one here. Yes, yeah, this one. Sorry, I wasn't sure where the mistake was. Yeah, this one is is indeed that way. Yeah, thank you. Ta -da -da. And then the final one is indeed C plus star C minus minus plus phi x minus 1, phi x plus 1. Okay. And now, now I can put this into a, a nice form here. So what I do is I, so first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to assume now that the, the, um, the state that I had was real, so it was a real wave function. I can put in that it was a it was a wave function but was not real. All I would get there is a e to the i theta here and an e to the i minus theta uh, minus i theta here because of these are complex conjugates of one another, and that would correspond to essentially rotating the phase of minus with respect to plus in the system state, but without decohering it. So it is indeed something that is interesting, but it's not important for the discussion we're going to have further. So for the, in the simple case now, I'm just going to consider that they are real. So I'm going to call this quantity f. So I'm going to call this quantity here. I'm going to define as f. And then what I can do is I can write this entire thing as the following. I can write it as f times psi psi. Because remember, what, what is the original, um, the original state of the system? Let me write this down here. So this just means that rho s in initially is c plus mod squared plus 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 c minus mod squared minus minus plus c plus c minus star plus minus plus c plus star c minus minus plus, right? So by taking f times that, I've gotten in exactly these last two terms. So it's f times c plus c minus star plus minus and the other one. Um, but I've not gotten all of these terms. So I've, I'm, I've taken f out of this, but now I need to add 1 minus f times that. And 1 minus f is only on this part, which is my decohered state. So plus, uh, let me call it rho, oh, rho s, see, rho s, decohered, which is basically, well, this this term here, but just for the case where you only have two eigenvalues, plus and minus. Okay, so I see that my final state is is just a mixture of having my um, initial undisturbed state plus my plus the uh, the the state that I would have gotten if I measured strongly with a pointer. Okay, so this this is somehow what we here we we really are characterizing the disturbance. So. So f, so one minus f is the disturbance. If f is equal to one, you don't decohere at all, so you have the original state. So one minus f is the disturbance. If f is equal to zero, then that means you have only a decohered state. So this one here. Uh, so what I've done is, so I, I have two expressions. So so I have rho s prime, which is in this form. And now I want to, so I have that row S originally was there. And OK, let me call it so the psi, psi of S. And then I define row S um, decohered to just be the first two terms. And that's it. So the original thing has all of the, the coherence. The, the decohered one has none of the coherence. And now I just, I, I just write this in terms of a linear combination of that. So if I take f times the first one and 1 minus f times the second one, 
f times 1 minus f of each of these terms is just going to give me one of them. But f times the first term is going to give me exactly here what I have here. So it's just the combination of them. OK. Now, the next question that I naturally want to answer, it's a bit weird to go all the way to the left, is um, what is the information I gain from this, this measurement? So, and here we, we require uh, a second concept. So we how to read the pointer. So in the case when my pointer was was a, was a delta function, it was kind of obvious how to read the pointer, right? I just make a measurement of x, and then I say, well, I'm I'm only going. To, the only answers I can get are where the delta functions are, which are exactly eigenvalues of a. But now I start with a wave function that could, in principle, be spread all over x. So when I measure the pointer, I'm going to get some value of x, which is a continuous variable. But on the other hand, the observable I'm trying to measure is a spin. It's, is it in the state plus or is it in the state minus? So here you see actually there is some freedom with how to interpret. So if I get a value x, I can do, so the, one of the things I can do is I can bin. I can bin uh, the values of x, so the, the range of x. And what I mean by bin is I mean like I, I consider intervals and I say if x is within this interval, I say we do plus. If x is within another interval, I do minus. I can also do a probabilistic thing, but that doesn't help me. That's just post-processing. So what would be the natural way of, of binning um, of that measurement? Well, I know that I, I start, I assume, for simplicity, I start with a, a pointer that's centered around 0. So if I start with a symmetric pointer, pointer centered around x equals to 0, okay? then what I have is that, well, it moves to the right. It's going to move to the right if it's in plus. It moves to the left if it's in minus. So a very easy way to do is to say, if x is greater than 0, I take the answer to be plus. And if x is less than 0, I take the answer to be minus. So I measure x of the pointer, and I say, if it's greater than 0, I, I infer the outcome plus. That's the best I can do. If x is less than 0, I infer the outcome minus. Okay? If you're making measurements of x, it turns out that actually you can argue that the best case is indeed to use a symmetric pointer. So it's not that you're going to get some uh, greater information with, uh, with something funky. Um, OK, so now once I have this binning, I can calculate what is the probability that I get the outcome plus. OK, so I, I put a question mark there because what I haven't done yet is I haven't written the state of the pointer. So let's write the state of the pointer, uh, the state da, 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 row of the pointer prime at the end of the measurement. And so I do the same thing. I take that, and I trace over, I trace over the system. But now this is nicer, actually, tracing over the system because the two terms with plus, minus, minus, plus, they just go away. So I'm just left with, with this. So uh, c plus mod squared, phi x minus 1, phi x minus 1. So it's just a mixture of two pure states of the pointer, phi x plus 1, phi x plus 1. OK. So now, what is the probability of plus? So the probability of getting the outcome plus is equal to, and now it's basically the probability that this is in, the st in any x greater than 0. So it's the probability that I do integral over from 0 to infinity of dx of this wave function. So uh, of, well, rho q prime. OK. Uh, I'm mean, going to have to put in x's there. So yeah, actually, so rho q prime times x. So trace, let's put it. So, so trace of x times rho q prime. And this is now integral from 0 to infinity. And I will get uh, c plus mod squared. I'm going to get uh, phi of x minus 1 mod squared. But I assumed it's, so I'll put mod squared, plus c minus but I assume it's real anyway, so that's not necessary. 5x plus 1 mod squared. 
dx. Okay, and this I can write in a particular manner. So because I assumed that I started with a symmetric pointer around zero, I know that the probability of the pointer in the beginning is exactly there is exactly half on the left and half on the right. So I can split these two things. So I can write this now as integral from, um, this is from one to infinity, c plus mod squared, phi of x minus one squared dx, plus integral from zero to one of the same. So I'm just isolating half of the wave function in one of them. I do the same thing here, plus uh, dx plus integral. So now with this one here, it's x plus one. So I say integral from minus one to infinity, c minus mod squared, phi of x plus one squared dx. And then the remainder, ah, I did minus one to infinity. So I have to now subtract the extra part that I did, zero to one, c minus mod squared, phi of x plus one mod squared dx. Okay. So it's exactly the same. I've just split zero to infinity as zero to one, one to infinity, and here is minus one to infinity and subtract the minus one to zero. And the reason I did this is because these terms here, so this here, uh, I can take the C plus, the, actually all of the C's I should have taken outside here. So this one is just half. Because if I integrate from one to infinity, the wave function from x minus one, I can do a simple um, relabel x minus one is equal to y, for instance, and this is still dy, and then y is from zero to infinity of phi of y but that's exactly half of a symmetric wave function, so that's just half. The same way this is gonna be just half. And because the wave function is symmetric, these two are actually equal um, from zero to one of five x minus one and from minus one to zero of five x plus one. So this now I can write as, let's continue here. This is going to be, so the probability of plus is now half c plus mod squared plus c minus mod squared plus, and this plus uh, integral zero to one. So I'm going to write it as integral from so integral from zero to one of five x minus one is. So let me write it schematically here, so this so let's put it there. So from zero to one of phi x minus one is the same as from minus one to zero of phi of x. So if my, my wave function is like this, this is minus one, this is plus one. Then this here so if I call this term one, this is term one. And now I do the same thing. Integral of five x plus one from minus one to zero is the same as integral of phi of y from zero to one. So this term now, if I can write it, if I write it as two, and this is the term two. Is that clear? And they are equal because I took it symmetric. So the integral under this part is equal to the integral under this part, which in turn is equal to half of the integral from minus one to plus one. So I can write this as now plus half of the integral of phi of x mod squared from minus one to plus one dx. And then I have c plus my and c plus things. So c plus mod squared minus c minus mod squared. Okay, is this clear? Using the fact that it's a symmetric function, but if you, I mean, yeah, if you go through these in step and do each of the change of variables so that it's still again phi of x, then you see all of these things come out. Okay, and what I now do is we label this quantity here that has appeared. Uh, we label this quantity g. Why do I do that? Because I want to do now a similar thing that I did for the state, I want to do with, with the probabilities. So what is the case, if I make a strong measurement, I know what the probabilities are. They're just C plus minus, 
and c minus well c plus mod squared and c minus mod squared sorry the square went outside there the other thing that i could do imagine that i um i consider that i don't make a measurement at all and i just guess what the answer is well then i would get the properties half and half so what i do now is i write this in the following form oh let's write it here um so i split so i have half g so i'm going to do it as i'm going to make this half times g plus 1 minus g of c plus mod squared plus c minus mod squared plus half of g c plus mod squared plus c minus mod squared and now i can collect terms so with g if i guess i should have ah sorry uh, one of the things I forgot to say is that c plus squared mod squared plus c minus squared this is of course equal to one because it's just the total well this is a trace of the system so that's just equal to one so actually this is this is also fine um, and this was a minus sorry I don't know how it happened uh, do do do. Have I done something wrong here? No, this is all good. Um, G. Ah, but I did want to keep it. Sorry. I did want to keep it. So plus C minus squared. Very good. I did want to keep that there. Um, and so now, okay, I collect all of the terms with C plus. And so I have half of G, half of G. So it's G times C plus mod squared. And now with the rest of the terms I have with C minus thing, I keep it just as so plus half, half. Yes, C minus squared is one minus C plus squared. Sorry, I should have done this in a neater way and I started the wrong way. So let me, let me just erase this line, do it again. Sorry for the mess. So I write this as half of G plus one minus G. Uh, and here I leave it uh, plus half G times, and this is two C plus squared minus one. Um, and the reason is because of course this is one minus C plus squared. I just want to isolate C plus squared. That was my goal. Uh, and so this is now, oh. if I collect the C plus, I just get G times C plus mod squared. And then if I collect the rest of the terms, I will get plus half minus one by two G, which is equal to G C plus mod squared plus one minus G times half, sorry. I started doing the calculation the wrong way, uh, and then everything was confusing. So yeah, this is just half plus that. Is that clear? Um, why did I want this? I wanted to put it, as I said, in the same form that I had put the state initially. What I have now is something nice. I have that the probability of getting the state, uh, of getting the outcome plus is a number g times what I would have got from a strong measurement. So if I made a strong measurement, this is the probability I would have gotten. And one minus G, uh, probability of just doing a random guess and saying, well, it's half plus or half minus. Okay, so both of my my state now this is now a, a representation of the information gain. Because there are many ways of defining this mathematical quantity, but here I've just taken it to be the amount to which the probability that I get matches the probability that I would have gotten from a strong measurement. And now we have both that the information gain and our disturbance are both, um, well, both our information and our disturbance are put in linear combinations of what I would have gotten from a strong or a weak measurement, okay? So, uh, okay, I think this is a good point to take a break because it's 10.30. So we'll take a break now, I'll answer some questions and we will continue at 10, yes. So. So, where were we?
indeed, the very f we can continue with the very first question that was asked. So we have our two quantities here, so let me write them down. So I have f, which is equal to um, phi of x minus 1, phi of x plus 1, which I can write in integral form. Integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of yeah, phi of x minus 1, phi of x plus 1 dx. And then I have g, which is equal to integral from minus 1 to plus 1 of phi of x mod squared dx. Now, what do we want? We want f to be as high as possible, because the higher f is, the better my, my state is to the original state of the system. So I've disturbed it less. We want g to be as high as possible, because the more g is, the higher g is, the more my probability of getting the outcome actually matches what I would get from a strong measurement, rather than just being a random guess. So f and g should be as high as possible. However, we can already see a, a couple of extremes. So strong measurement g is equal to 1. So I have full information. So my probability of getting the outcome is entirely due to the original property. There's no, no random guessing. But if g is equal to 1, that means that psi of x is only not equal to 0 for, for x in this interval, minus 1 to plus 1. Because g is equal to 1 means, so this is basically the, the, mod, the mod squared of phi of x is just the, the norm of the wave function being in this interval. So if I say g is equal to 1, it means the, the wave function is entirely in that interval. So outside plus 1 and minus 1, there is no wave function. So psi of x is only not equal to 0 for that. But if that is the case, then phi of x minus 1 times phi of x plus 1 is equal to 0 for all of x. Okay, And the way of doing it is to take, yeah, so take a wave function like this. So imagine that your wave function was entirely contained here. If I shift it to the left, I will have something here, so between minus 2 and 0. If I shift it to the right, I'll have something between 0 and 2. There's no overlap between them, so I get f is equal to 0. So if g is equal to 1, f is equal to 0. There's no way out of it. Okay. Now, it's, so the, um, well, the other version is that, so the trivial thing to do is where f is equal to 1. So phi of x minus 1 and phi of x plus 1 are essentially the same wave function. Now, this, is, this of course, is not possible to, except in a limit. What you have to do is you have to take phi of x minus 1 and phi of x plus 1 to be very, very, very broad. And you take the limit that they're infinitely broad. In that case, then, the well, actually, this is pretty much the same as what we were doing with the, the work source and the ladder. Like we, you, you have that the, the overlap is higher and higher as your state becomes broader and broader. But if the state becomes broader and broader, then the probability of the state being in this interval keeps going to 0. So if, I, if f is equal to 1, what you will end up getting is that g is equal to 0 in a limiting case. So you can, you can do it explicitly with, let's take an L range and, and do it. So f is equal to 1, g is equal to 0. OK, so here you already see there is a sort of a trade-off, which makes sense. Otherwise. Otherwise, the fact that quantum measurements disturb would be, would be completely, well, would not actually exist if, if we didn't have to trade off the information gain versus the disturbance. And so now the question is, um, what is the optimal relation between f and g? g versus f or f versus g? Let's say g versus no, f versus g. Oh, it doesn't matter. What is the optimal relation between f and g? So given a fixed value of f between 0 and 1, how high can I make g, or vice versa, right? Now, you can actually do this by, in fact, in the, in the, in the paper that we did this for uh, physical pointers, you can actually take these two quantities, and then you can make a Lagrangian. You can fix one of them, and Lagrange optimize for the other. You get a very a non-trivial wave function. It, it has to be something that is essentially anything between minus 1 and plus 1, and then you repeat that between in the next block, minus 3 to plus 3, minus, sorry, minus 3 to minus 1, minus 5 to minus 3, falling under an exponential envelope. We're not going to go into that, but the answer to the question, to this question, and you will do this for the qubits, by the way, and, and find this optimally, is that f squared plus g squared is, well, equal to, for in the case of the optimal, 
is equal to 1. So you can get f squared plus g squared equals to 1. And uh, sorry, what was I about to say here? Yeah, OK. All right. Ah, yes, I was going to say this is, so it's a non-trivial thing. So for example, not for Gaussians, for instance. So if I just say, ah, let me take a, a Gaussian pointer for my, for my physical pointer and see whether, I, whether this is satisfied, it's not satisfied. So it, it really is a, a, a non-trivial uh, construction in F. And now what I want to compare this to is the following. So compare to, to probabilistic strong measurement. What do I mean by a probabilistic strong measurement? I say, well, I have my system. Well, I have many copies of the system, whichever way. And what I do is I say, I will flip some biased coin, which has some probability p and, or 1 minus p. And when the coin lands heads with the probability p, I make a strong measurement. And that's the statistics I get. If the coin lands uh, on tails and is 1 minus p, then I don't do anything. And I just guess the outcome, half, half on half. Okay? So I do this. So what I do is, with p, I make a strong measurement. Okay? And what will what will be the state and the information in that case? So in that case, what I get is that my my row system prime is just row decohered. And my information, so I just write the property of plus will just be C plus squared. And with one minus P, I just guess. I don't do any measurement. So no measurement, in which case my row system prime is actually equal to the original state, psi psi, and my probability of getting the state plus is equal to half, because I just randomly guess. Okay, And now, what does this mean? If I collect the statistics of this, then I have that my row system prime is going to be p times this one, 1 minus p times that one, so it's p um, rho decohered plus 1 minus p rho, uh, sorry, psi psi. And my probability of the outcome plus is going to be p times the probability that I would get from a strong measurement, so c plus mod squared, plus 1 minus p times what I would get uh, by guessing, which is half. What does this mean? Now I can compare that to the, the f and the 1 minus f. This is in the same form. So here f is equal to 1 minus p. And in this case, g is equal to p, which together means that f plus g is equal to 1. So I see there again I have a trade-off. f plus g is a constant value, but it is a different trade-off from the one I got in the case of the optimal uh, choice of the optimal pointer. And the way I can graphically interpret this is I draw this graph now. I say, let this be g. And this is now f. And this is a 1, 0, 1. This is mixture, mix of strong and no measurement. And my optimal pointer gives me that. So f squared plus, so this is the, we call it the, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, indeed. So I think in, in, in the one of the tutorial problems, what you will do is you will use a qubit as a pointer, and the qubit will rotate, and the, 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 st the, the state of the pointer, rather than starting, in this case, it starts at x equals 0 and rotates. There, the qubit would start in some state in the block sphere and then rotate by theta in one way or the other, depending on your outcome. And then you would end up with one, one of the f being cos theta and g being sine theta, for example. And then, you know, f sine squared plus cos squared is 1, for instance. So indeed, yeah. OK, why is this important? So, so just as a review, what we've done now is 
I mean, this is, of course, a very simple example with qubits. And once you have higher dimensional systems, it's very likely that you're not going to be able to write very clean formulas for, oh, I just have a mixture of doing nothing and, and weak and stuff. But in all of the cases, what you can always do is you can look at the fact that there's a trade-off between how much you disturb the state and how much information you've gained from the measurement. So this is nice because now we've, we've sort of plugged the gap between the strong projective measurement all the way to doing nothing with a, with a sort of a spectrum in between. And importantly, we see that the spectrum is not trivial. So if it was the case, for instance, that the optimal trade-off was just f plus g is equal to 1, then there was really no point going, oh, I, I have a pointer with a non-trivial overlap. I can just go, either I strongly measure, measure or, I, or I do nothing, and it would be the same. Given that we have a better trade-off, f squared plus g squared is equal to 1, we know that we actually, if we have an intermediate regime where we want some information but not full, and we are ready to disturb the state but not fully and not non-trivially, uh, not trivially, then we can actually use a, a pointer, a quantum pointer, whose behavior will give us a better trade-off. And in particular, there, are, there is one uh, important thing, which is that the behavior of f squared plus g squared is equal to one is especially different at the boundaries. So essentially, if so, for instance, if f is equal to delta, uh, not f, sorry, uh, if g. If g is equal to delta, which is much smaller than 1, okay, so this is now small information gain, okay, then what you have is that f, or at least the optimal value of f, is equal to square root of 1 minus uh, delta squared, which is approximately 1 minus delta squared over 2 when delta is small. This is the, the small approximation. You can also look at it as sine theta and cos theta. Sine of delta is just delta. Cos of delta is 1 minus delta squared over 2. And so what you see now is you have a, a first order information gain and a second order disturbance. Okay? And this is useful because now what you can, whenever you have something that is first order and second order, it's exactly the way that we had in a in a protocol for for erasure where i was having a first order change in my state but only a second order error in landau then i can always do a trade off if i have enough copies i can ensure that i get a finite change in the quantity that i want but for a vanishing change in the quantity i don't want so in this case for example here if i have an ensemble of states of of n states and i do weak measurements on them so this is really now this is what we call a weak measurement then I can have that the information gain for a large enough n adds up to, to really tell me what the state is, while the disturbance is actually much smaller. So this is also something that you will review explicitly in the tutorial. OK, good. Any questions? No? All right, so now I will go to actually the whole concept of weak measurements in particular, because they are in the theoretical and, and for foundationals. Foundational questions, quite important. So, okay, so I return back to the von Neumann measurement picture. So I say, so my weak measurement now, weak measurements, I have my state of the system, psi s which is equal to, as before, well, I don't really need to write it out. Let, let me write it. Okay, sum over A, C, A, A. And uh, it's a weak measurement, and I actually say with position pointers. Okay. So A, A. And I have my state of the the pointer, phi um, of the pointer, so I have a phi of x of the pointer q. q. And then I have the, the uh, von Neumann unitary, so the unitary here is e to the minus i. And I write it in general, so I, I didn't write this before, g a tensor p on the pointer, so system pointer. Now, I didn't write g initially uh, in the previous analysis because G is basically an amplifier or a dampener of the eigenspectrum of A. So if you just 
essentially what you get is that instead of translating by an eigenvalue, you translate by g times that eigenvalue. So you can always, given g, given the eigenvalues, and given the width of the pointer, you can absorb one into the other two, and, and you can leave it g is equal to one. So we're not going to take this into account. g is equal to one here. OK, but what we are going to say is that we are going to now work in the regime where our wave function here, phi of x, is so broad that it has a very high overlap even when it's shifted by one of the eigenvalues of A. Okay? So essentially I'm working in, in, a, in a regime where so if if this is so let's say this is zero and this is a one, a two, a three, dot dot dot. So let's let's call this a minimum and some a maximum and this is sort of the eigenspectrum. So spectrum of A. Then my wave function initially is something that's very broad. Okay, so this is phi of x. Okay. Now again, as I said, I can do an absorption here. So for example, if I start with my wave function quite thin, then I could choose a coupling constant g that's very small. So that instead of translating by a, I translate by a fraction of a and then squeeze this. So either way, I can use g, the eigenvalues, and the width to adjust how I like to, to make this the case. OK? Now, what is going to happen in this case? So one of the ways of looking what happens in this case. So the point in this case is really that looking at an individual measurement of, of the wave function is not really going to tell you much because it's so broad that essentially, regardless of what eigenvalue of a the system, which, which I can say the system A was going to be, the wave function you get is going to look almost the same. So now we do the unitary. We say e to the minus i a s p q acting on psi s tensor phi of x. OK? And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, this is approximately identity minus i a s tensor p q acting on the same phi s tensored phi of x okay good so, for instance, if I if I now was to um, if I now was to say, well, I, I expand this in terms of the eigenvalues of a, then indeed each of these would be well, I would get the same expression that I had before. But now what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to add something a bit different. Ah, oh, this board is very irritating. So with so let, okay, let me conclude this discussion by saying, if I was to go through this procedure, and then ask, well, what is what happens when I look at the pointer? I get something very similar. I'm going to get a, a very low value of g because I, I get hardly any information by looking at the pointer, a very high value of f because I've hardly disturbed the system because the pointers have very high overlap. And in particular, one thing I could do is I can say, well, let me look at the expectation value of the position of the pointer. So this is one thing I could do. I can say, let me look at the pointer um, over, over many repetitions of such an experiment with different copies of, of the system, find all of the values of x, collect the statistics, and then one thing that is very simple to see, and you could see it, for example, where did we see it? It's no longer there. It's no longer there. So what you can see is that the expectation value of the pointer will become the expectation value of A itself. And this is because, well, so for instance, this, as we know, this is just, uh, this implies that the final state of the pointer, for example, is going to be sum over a c a mod squared phi of x minus a phi of x minus a. So this is something that I'd written down before. So and of course now if I measure x on this and I ask what is the expectation value of this uh, measurement, I'm just going to get the, the sum of c a mod squared times the value a. So I'm going to get the expectation value of obs observable. This is if I don't do anything to the system after I've coupled it to the pointer. What we're going to add now is a post-selection. So I post-select on the system. And what I will result 
can get, what I will get as a result, is what we call a weak value. Um, is the concept of post-selection been mentioned in the previous course? No. So this is entirely new. So let me just explain what this is in the first place. So post-selection is a very uh, simple concept. It's, so usually we are used to a description of, of quantum mechanics. That is, I had a state that was prepared or undergoes some dynamics. Then I make a measurement of it, and then I have some outcome at the end. Right? This is a very time asymmetric picture of quantum mechanics because I really go, my measurement is always after the state. So every time I have a measurement, what it's doing is it's reacting to information about the system in the past. And at some point in, and this is of course different from classical physics because in, in classical physics somehow, if I, if I know the state of a system at time t, then I know what it is at times t before that. I know what it is, I can evolve backward and forward uh, exactly the same. In quantum mechanics, the unitary evolution has this property. I can evolve backward in time, evolve forward in time, and I, 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 I can apply the Schrodinger equation in both uh, directions. But measurements do not appear to have this property because I say, well, if I measure the system, it's measuring what is before that and preparing something for after. So one way of tackling this is to create a time asymmetric, uh, sorry, time symmetric version of this by saying, in fact, every time I have a measurement, I can consider that I have information about the system not only before, but also after. And so I could say that, so the usual way of writing this would be at some, so this is the increasing direction of time. So at some time t, I had psi. And psi was sent into a measurement device. And, and this, for example, can be described by a, a set of Krauss operators. It can be described by this observable A. So, I, so in this case, for example, it's described by the set of uh, projectors A. And then it evolves after that. But I also know that at a later time, the state must be phi. And I write it with the opposite way. Uh, and I'll explain why. How would I do this? So there are two ways of doing this. So fundamentally, I can just look at it as I know the state must be phi there, and I know the state must be psi in the beginning. So what do I get for outcomes in the middle? The operational manner of doing this is I can do an experiment where, the, where I have psi, I do a measurement, and at the later time, I simply do a second measurement, one of the outcomes of which corresponds to this one. So for example, if phi was the state 0 on a spin, I could make a z measurement here. And if I got this, the answer 0, then I keep the statistics that I just collected from, from here, from the measurement. But if I got the outcome 1, I just throw it away. So this is why it's called post-selection. I have, I, I have an ensemble of such states, I, I, which I prepare all in the same state. I do the same measurement. I, I collect, all this, collect the data points corresponding to each of the things in the ensemble. But then at the end, I do a measurement. And if my measurement gives me the answer I want, I keep the data. If I, the measurement doesn't give it to me, I throw it away. So I've post-selected the data. Okay? Now, what is the answer that I would get for such a measurement? Um, so for instance, one of the things that you can, you can calculate is that the probability of getting the outcome A in such a measurement, it's going to look very similar to the standard quantum mechanical property. So you have an amplitude. You had psi, then you went through A. But then, usually, you, you just put in back psi here. But here, you have an amplitude because you need to go, you need that your state evolves from psi. You project it onto A. And then at the end, it's phi. So this is the amplitude of, of this particular thing happening. That's the probability that you will start in psi, you will project on A, and you will go to phi. And then you have to renormalize by the entirety of the probability of actually succeeding with the post-selection. So you have psi, A, A. Phi, uh, so let's call this a prime, a prime, sum over a prime, mod squared. So this actually, I've detoured a little bit from weak measurements here. So this is the probability. If you did a strong measurement here, what would be the probability that you found the outcome a, for instance? Okay. Okay. So now, why do I do that? I want to consider what will happen if I make a post selection on the system here. And then I look at the pointer. Or I look at the pointer given that I had a post-selection on the system. Okay. So now this is a bit of a detour. Let me just enclose this. Okay. Now, so let me repeat that there. So what I have. So I had e to the minus i a tensor p in the pointer system acting on psi s tensored phi of the pointer, or phi of x in the pointer. I'll just put it as phi at the moment. Okay, 
And I also now have a post selection. So at the end, let me write this down. So at the end, I'm going to post select on the state phi. Oh, I'm going to have phi again. No, so let's not choose that. Use phi for the pointer. So let's use a different letter here. Let me just use it as beta. Yes. Okay. Right. So now I do the same thing as I had before there. So I, I write this now. This is equal to eta and so approximately eta identity minus e to the minus i, oh, sorry, minus i a system tensored eq acting on phi s tensored psi q okay which is now uh, equal to so i write eta psi s times identity minus and here we put minus i uh, so. so in this case here because i have an eta and a psi s what i can do is i can already take the the average of eta as psi so i'm going to define that now somewhere else so let me write this quantity so eta as psi divided by eta psi, I'm going to call the, um, the weak value uh, a weak on, oh, I need some notation. So I'm just going to call it a weak at the moment because I'm not going to change between eta and psi or anything else. So I'm just going to keep that as a weak. Uh, and this is, now this is a number. So this is, this is an operator, but I have the, well, the amplitude here inside, so this a weak is actually a number. So what I have now is a weak times p, the operator on q, acting on the state phi q. Okay, is this clear? So the first term is was very simple. It's just identity. So it's eta psi s, and and the identity part on s goes away. So I only have the identity part acting on phi q. And for the second term, I simply replaced eta a s psi s by a weak times this over um, eta times psi, which is of course outside here. So this is so clear, this is okay. Okay, and so now, now I do the, the same approximation that I started with, but in the opposite direction, eta psi s. I say that this is actually approximately equal to the operator e to the minus i a weak pq acting on phi, phi of q. Which is indeed just eta psi of e, uh, psi s, oh, I should have written this as s everywhere, times uh, phi of, let's call it x minus a week. So it's just a translation operator on the on the pointer Q. So I didn't put the X everywhere, it was implicit. That this is all wave functions of X. Okay. Now the uh, immediate question of course is uh, when do, when do these approximations hold? So this is something that you can do explicitly by taking uh, a particular version of the pointer. So the easiest version is to just take the, the Gaussian pointer, for example, take a, a wide Gaussian, give it an explicit width, so a sigma, and then look at the, the difference between this operator acting on stuff and this operator acting on stuff and the same way here and here. And the answer that you get is that, um, so when are these approximations valid? I would put it in blue. So this is valid. Oh. So take pointer of width 
So approximately, let's say, uh, let's call it sigma. Now, it's not just that the width has to be the, this way. So for example, I can't take a pointer whose wave function is just a square block, because that is a problem. The, the square block, um, when I shift it, and if I subtract or subtract one from the other, for example, it just cancels out. It has to be something that's slowly changing. So for a Gaussian, this works. For other wave functions, it probably work for anything that is, is gradually changing and peaked. But um, it's not, it's not going to work for, for example, non-changing or constant wave functions. But if I take a Gaussian, so let's just Gaussian or, or similar of width sigma, then this one works, works if sigma is much greater than ak for all k. So basically, that the width is, as I said, much greater than any, any eigenvalue that you have for all k. And this one will work if sigma is much greater than a weak itself, which is kind of implicit here, because I'm, I'm translating by a weak. So we need that the width is actually much greater than a weak. So if you have those two conditions, then these two things work. OK? Now, what have I gotten here? Uh, yes. So this is the final state of the pointer. However, this is actually not, this is the final state of the pointer multiplied by the amplitude that I get it. So when I post select, um, I renormalize the state. So when I say I, I make a post selection, then I say, what is the state of the pointer given that I did succeed, that I did actually, my post selection actually worked. So the final state of the pointer. of the pointer is just this state, but renormalized. So of course, this is just going to go away. It's just going to be phi of x minus a weak q. OK? And so what I see now is that my pointer has been shifted by a weak, this weak value. And the special property of this weak value is that usually when I consider these measurements, my, my pointer always moves within the spectrum of eigenvalues. Even if, the, even if the wave function of the point itself is very broad, if I didn't make a post selection and I ask what is the expectation value of the pointer, then I get the expectation value of the, of the observable A itself. And of course, you know, the expectation value of any observable has to be in the spectrum of eigenvalues. It cannot be outside. But there is no constraint like that for this quantity. And the reason, I mean, mathematically, you can see the reason. The reason is because eta and psi can actually be very close to orthogonal. So for example, I could take um, one simple example would be imagine taking, so take psi to be 0 and eta to be not 1, but close to 1. So let's say uh, sine of theta 0 plus cos of theta 1. So in this case here, and, and theta is small, so theta being small. Oh, well, theta can be anything, really, but let's just take that to be the representative thing. And then we can take our observable A to be, for instance, the observable, um, the observation of the, the spin in the plus minus basis. So plus plus minus minus minus. OK. Um, and then here in the. We take it that way. Yes. So then, in the in the numerator, for example, here, what will I get? Zero acting zero acted upon by this observable is going to give me plus minus minus. So eta. So I will get what is it? Sine theta zero plus cos of theta one acting on plus plus minus minus minus. I hope the weak value of this is not zero, because then that would be I'd have to choose another one and acting on zero. And so this is uh, so this is the numerator. Sine theta zero plus cos theta one. And this will simply give me uh, 1 over square root of 2 plus minus 1 over square root of 2 minus. 
and then, okay, I will get the term. So one over square root of two, oh, so one out of two, sorry, and I will get sine of theta uh, from this and this, then minus, minus sine of theta from the next one, uh, plus cos of theta from the next one, and then plus cos of theta from the final one, so that becomes cos of theta, so that's the numerator, and the denominator, which is eta psi, is just sine of theta. Sine of theta, so from this I get that the weak value is cos theta by sine theta, so it's cot of theta, and this is a, is a number that's anywhere between zero and infinity, basically, right? Um, which is very outside the eigenvalue of the, uh, outside the eigenvalues, because my observable, the eigenvalues are plus one and minus one, and now I've got a weak value that was cot of theta. Yeah. Now, there is a, so I, I, will, I will put in uh, references for the various calculations that I've done that have not gone into detail. So for instance, you can look at, you can take a Gaussian pointer and you can, you can calculate these, these things. And what do you see here? This condition is very important. Sigma has to be much greater than A weak, which means that as you try and get a weak value that is higher and higher, then you need your sigma to become larger and larger. If you were to take a Gaussian point of a particular width, and then you were to go through this, uh, um, go through this procedure, not assuming that you get the weak value, but go through the physical procedure, what you see is that the weak value could increase as, as you made theta closer and closer to zero until it gets to a certain point of the order of sigma, and then it, it fails to increase. It then actually goes back down to zero. So for a weak value, you always need to choose your... your um, the strength of your measurement and the width of the pointer to match the, the magnitude of the weak value that you're going to get. This is the point. Okay, I don't have time to go into why weak values are important today, so this, this will be a brief discussion next time. I'm not sure how much detail I can go into it. It's essentially the case that when we do, um, when we consider paradoxes in quantum mechanics, so there are various paradoxes that you can construct um, analogous to um, uh, well, so for instance, you can you can send a, well you can consider info, interfer interferometric experiments. So for instance, I send an electron down a beam splitter, and you can do um, particular things with the pre and post selection of the electron in such a way that you see that whenever you measure the electrons, um, the one of the uh, things about the electron. So for example, whether the electron has gone on the left and the or the right, you see that it must have gone on the left. So if you make a strong measurement of it. Whereas if you measure some spin of the electron in a particular direction, you see that it, you only get the answers for that uh, non-zero spin on the right one. So it's somehow the electron has physically traveled on the, on the left, but its polarization has gone on the right of the interferometer. This is sort of, this is sort of the quantum Cheshire cat. There's also the, um, the pigeon paradox, where if you have, what is it, if you have uh, two boxes and three pigeons, or the other way around, um, then, then for classically, for example, if you have two boxes and three pigeons, then it must be that one box has two pigeons uh, uh, because you, it, it cannot, if, if you have three pigeons within two boxes, then it must be that one box has a number of pigeons. But in the quantum mechanical case, I think it's three boxes. So I'm not sure what happens. Um, in the quantum mechanical case, you can have a pre and post selection that corresponds to somehow if you, you measure each box, you, you end up finding that the, um, ah, it's yes. It's two pigeons and three boxes. And you end up finding that the pigeon must be in all of the boxes? I'm not sure. Three pigeons and two boxes. Okay, so the original thing is correct. Yes. 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 Right, so then in the quantum mechanical case, you can construct a prepared state of the particles. There are three particles, two places they can be, and a post-selected state in such a way that you don't get that there are um, uh, multiple particles in one box. Oh, yes, yes. So, okay, I will, I will find the exact nature of these things. The point is that with these paradoxes, what you can look at, instead of looking at the strong measurement results, which sort of enforce the, which give you a paradox, what you can look at is the weak values of the measurement that you get, and they, explain, even though the weak values themselves look like they're outside the spectrum, when you look at them together for the various cases that you can do the paradox in, you see that they explain somehow the physical nature of what is, what is somehow going on mathematically in the experiment that, that explains sort of the, the reason you get the paradoxical answers. So that's one thing we do in the next lecture. And the other thing we will do is look at macroscopic measurements, which is to plug the, the gap between the quantum fully disturbing measurement and the fact that in 
in everyday life, we can look at systems and actually not disturb them. And with that, I conclude the lecture. Thank you very much.